consoles. And I, I'm leaning towards the PS4, but... Um, okay, how are we doing on... All right, rock and roll. Um, hope everybody is good. A couple of things uh, you will notice on the syllabus. Um, I have... There are two classes that are not going to have guest speakers. And one of them is based on last year, where I left the guest speaker about 14 minutes um, because it was the class on violence and sexism in games. And that really will take up the whole time and is a great discussion class. So I'd really rather do it that way. And the other one is a little bit of a nod to where we are in the course, but also something uh, that, that I feel could be done better this year, and that is originality in games. So we're actually going to have a guest speaker uh, the week before, but then I'm going to take two hours and do as much of a deep dive with as much discussion as possible uh, around the issue of originality. Um, because as you will see, I'm starting to feel that it's the emergent meme of this course, of this particular class. And every, every class is a little bit different. Um, so where are we now? Uh, this is the end of the the part of the course on creating, or about creating. Uh, and today we talk for the full two hours really about modding and remixing. And Professor Greg Listauka of Rutgers uh, Law is going to join us remotely uh, for the second hour. And he's doing some very interesting research in the area. Um, and then next week, we will start talking about connecting, and you will see that we connect around contracts. And then controlling is uh, largely government intervention and law and privacy issues and surveillance issues this year. Um, and Given that one class was canceled uh, for reasons out of all of our control, uh, for university reasons, um, I will either move the last two talks into the final week, or I might, if, if really ambitious, just give you an extra video of some description, and I'll record something in advance. Um, and that can um, meet the requirements. I've, I've emailed the associate dean about the options and sought some feedback. So um, I think we've got a theme to our class so far. Uh, and, and that is what constitutes a video game and how is it differentiated? And it's shown up a number of ways, right from Matt's first post on, on the website. Um, about our video games of sport, um, based on the discussion in the first week about Madden NFL. Um, and then I just want to note, and you'll find it in News of the Week, uh, that the New York Times actually did a video on the our video games of sport. So it's about a three, four minute piece of reportage. It's, it's very well done, as you would expect. Um, and then didn't talk about this earlier, but there is this other strange thing that goes on that we haven't talked about and probably won't talk about that much. So this may be the only opportunity. And it's the notion, instead of defining what a game is, where the game becomes everything. And there's this quaint phrase, gamification. And everyone 
is try and there's a whole industry that's grown around gamifying non-games. And it's about incentives, it's about adding the elements of games that hook us in as gamers into other largely commercial parts of the world. Um, and there are also some positive sides to that. And so I'll just, you know, take you to Doug Rushkoff, um, who believes that you can prototype democracy by using gaming techniques. So gamification arguably can, can apply to everything. Um, related to the what is a game, what isn't a game, um, is what do you hook the IP onto? And we discussed Boyden at length last time. Uh, I'm not going to do that again. But all of which is to, to, to go to the point that today's topic, which is mods, is really part of this question of what is a game and what isn't a game. You know, is an add-on done by somebody else, built on original IP, which is somebody else's, from the person who mods it, a game, what is it? And I think we're really getting uh, to, a, to a point where we're seeing how pervasive the definition of game is and actually should be. So not to harp on what I said the, the first week, but my argument to you, and remember the first week is always about trying to keep the students in your class. Um, was, hey, video games are really, really important. They seem really trite, but they are because of the confluence of money and technology and addicted souls like many of us in this room, they carry a whole lot of innovation and they tend to get to the future as fast and more likely faster than other technologies. Um, and then this week we had a, a, a great contribution, uh, actually last week from Sean Urker on, uh, on the Silicon Knights um, issue, which had to do with core technologies um, of games and how other developers contract for them, use them, what could go right, what could go wrong. Um, it's a modding theme in, a, in, in its own sense, although a contractual one. And then all of this goes, and we'll be talking about this sort of week seven, week eight, to this undifferentiated place of, well, what do you do with a game like Ingress mated to Google Glass? Ingress is a is a Google game based, uh, which, which, in which you play a game on your handheld device or soon on your Google Glass in the real world. And you're superimposing the game on the real world. So all of this, um, what is a game stuff, leads to a place, at least a temptation, to say it's everything. You know, we... Um, we are in the matrix. So how do we start parsing out some of this? And why is gaming becoming everything? And what is the core bit of transformation that gaming rides on that has led to this everythingness. So I, to, to try and explain that quickly, I'm going to go to the core of IP law, at least to me, and that's the notion of the idea expression dichotomy. I mentioned it briefly previously. I'm going to do a slightly deeper dive. 
There is in the orthodoxy of intellectual property law, and the orthodoxy of copyright law, and I'd like you to focus in on copyright in particular here, no protection for an idea. It is only in the expression of the idea that there is protection. There's lots of possible criticisms of that notion and that orthodoxy, but it is the Western mode of law. And the obvious criticism is what do you do about oral storytelling cultures? What do you do uh, that, that are seeking to protect the integrity of their work? But they don't write anything down. They don't fixate anything. Um, so what do you do in those circumstances? Beyond the purview of this course, um, but fascinating issue. There is a fair bit of criticism, as you guys know, as, as law students, of the law in terms of its inability or alleged inability to keep up with the digital world. And I'm going to argue that it's not the law. That's the problem. I'll try and show you what the problem is. So imagine this classroom 70 years ago. And yes, you know, you all have laptops. They, have, they take notes. But this is today. Today, almost everything gets fixated immediately. This class is being taped, it's going to a hard drive as we speak. There's your fixation. Somebody, uh, somebody may tweet something. Somebody, um, you know, I've, I've got slides. Um, and this goes on and on and on. Um, and we've just recently learned that uh, uh, the US authorities have apparently fixated everything on a giant bank of computers that's ever been done in the last five years. So. Um, there's some fascinating copyright. Nobody, in, in just as an aside, on this whole surveillance thing, people aren't talking about the copyright implications of it. And I, I think there, there's something fascinating to be explored there. Um, uh, and, and I wonder if there are some remedies around there. Um, so what? Big deal. That's nice. Things are, are, are being fixated at the speed of light. Well, the argument is that, say, 70 years ago, an idea could gestate. There was a balance. There was a balance where something was an idea, and it actually roughly accorded with things being private. And then when it became an expression, and became public. So there, there's a symmetry to that. Today, the world looks a lot more like this. The public expression part of our lives, especially through social media, is really huge. So we've turned to a place where perhaps it is not the law or the conceptual framework of the law that's the problem, but Technology has changed how the law applies. So how do we do that? We need to rebalance. And in that context, you might want to think about remixing, modding, as rebalancing mechanisms. And I'll try and show uh, by the end of, of my time uh, before we we move on to Greg, that you have some support if you think that way, both amongst the legislature and the Supreme Court of Canada.
And I'm not sure why this is not. Uh oh. So, just want to mention, and I'll come back to this theme, that there are rebalancing changes that are in process. The obvious one that you will read about a lot in the United States is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. No provider or user of an interactive service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker. So it's an immunity provision that says if you're just publishing something, you're not liable directly for what was said. Now, there's also a notion in the United States of takedown. So if you've been given notice that you have copyright infringing work on your site, then if you don't take it down, liability can attack. Then you get this very interesting piece, unabashedly from one of Google's lawyers, that argues that in the digital age, it's not so simple. So think about the bifurcation here. If you are an author, you're responsible for your words and you get certain protections of freedom of expression. If you are a publisher, you're not responsible for the author's words on the internet if you just happen to repeat them. But you also aren't seen as being entitled to a particular expressive right yourself. So Google's lawyers argue that search is and ought to be, is, is a form of expression and ought to be protected. What Google does with search should be protected by freedom of speech, freedom of expression in Canada. And this split, I'm protected because I'm protected because I don't know the content under Section 230, becomes hard to reconcile with, I'm protected in the content because I'm just like an author, even though I'm a search engine. So I, I commend the paper to you. It's, um, uh, it's, it's well worth it. A simpler notion, Supreme Court of Canada says there's a right to hyperlink. You're protected in hyperlinking. And that's in terms of, of, of intellectual property. So that's a big one. That actually, in many ways, and we're going to talk about the pentology, but that, the acknowledgement of that right in Crooks and Newton is a very big deal and a very big precedent to, in fact, what comes later. Uh, John, I'm just I'm curious as to how this works in Canada when you start to hyperlink or to retweet or to post um, things that would be considered like profane or obscene or promoting hate. Um, do you still have the right to like link and do all those things because you're not responsible for the content? Well, th there, th there is definitely the question of what do you know? You know, do you know that what you are republishing has such hateful content or are you simply just retweeting stuff because that's what you do? Those of us who tweet 
Do you read every article that you retweet a link to? And every word of every article? I doubt it. I don't. You know, I see an interesting topic. Sometimes I'll scan a couple of paragraphs and I'll send it along. Very often I'll read the whole thing. But not always. So, yeah, there's a fairly profound protection. But that protection, and again, I, I take you back to Crooks and Newton, um, that protection wanes based on the degree of your knowledge. So you have to, you have to look at it that way. There, there's a long tradition of this, though, in broadcast law. Uh, basically, the whole notion of a cable company um, being able to provide cable services, whether or not there was going to be um, any kind of, of liability for copyright infringement. And it largely was determined on the sense of whether or not the republisher, the, the cable company or whatever, was merely a conduit or if it actually could affect or did affect the content. If there was modifications to anticipate where we're... Yes, where exactly. We're there, then you are no longer merely a conduit. If there is knowledge which is essentially implied by the notion of a notice and takedown kind of regime where someone says, okay, I just retreated this, we retweeted this, I didn't read all of it, I didn't know what was there, I didn't change anything, I merely passed it on as it was. That is not considered the same level of liability as if you have been told. Well, in fact, that's protected. And, and to build on your point... In the Telecommunications Act, you will find a strict prohibition against the telecommunications provider interfering with your content. That's right. So, and, and of course, the telecommunications provider has no liability for your content. If someone does a drug deal on a, on a cell phone, TELUS isn't liable for it. No. So there's a continuum here. And the basic principle that gets established is that once there's a modification of content, there's potential liability for that modification. But simply passing along the content has become a necessary exception in the digital age, and the courts have recognized it both in Canada and the United States. So Section 230 in the U.S., Crooks and Newton in Canada, and I'm just trying to establish the principle. But it was also in the analog age, too. Yes. Um, and there's a long tradition for that. The fundamental distinction between being a broadcaster and merely a cable company um, led to all sorts of cultural policy questions in terms of uh, whether or not there would be royalties, whether or not you are liable for defamation or any of those sorts of things going down the line. Um, all of those sorts of things were largely settled even before we got, got to this. What complicates matters is when there is a change because the, then the concept of fixation, which is there for evidentiary purposes, not for much of anything else, it's always been there for evidentiary purposes. Some of the earliest copyright cases that we have uh, where fixation was, a, was an issue, came about, I've forgotten the name of the case now, but it was essentially a set of public lectures. And what happened was a number of people came to listen to the lecture, and a couple of fellows wrote up the content of the lecture and published it. And when the author said, no, no, that was my lecture kind of thing that they've done, they said there was no fixation at that, at that point, because nobody recorded it, there weren't notes down or anything which then left you with a huge evidentiary problem. How can you tell how derivative of the original work, the subsequent work is, if you don't have any fixed in time point that you can compare it to, to see if there's been substantial similarity? So it has more to do with the monetizing of the economic rights than it has with protections of ideas or not. And when you're talking about taking ideas out of 
you know, protection. They, they've never been protected the same way as in patent law, a, a straight theorem is not protected. Um, formula are not protected. Numbers are not protected. Those are considered to be the basic building blocks of being able to do any kind of work in science and inventing. They cannot be taken out of common ownership or you will in fact diminish the possibilities for creation. And that, in the U.S. law in particular, is, is actually strictly prohibited in the, under the Constitution. So there, there are a, a series of cases on this um, involving, and, and where it got originally very interesting was a live Montreal Alouettes football game, for example. A 1957 case, the Canadian case that you can find, and 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 there are all these defenses, and we've seen them in video game law as well. Of well, where is the fixation? Um, moving forward, I've alluded to last week. Where do you find a right to create? There's all these other words in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, the American Constitution, the First Amendment, uh, and our charter. And none of them are specific around creation and remixing. And so the, the, the question for today is, can one be established? Should one be established? Um, and I, I have to cite this because it always makes me laugh. The, the anti-mod sentiment is, in, in my ironic view, best exemplified by this notion of uh, you know, a gaming company who sues modders. Uh, we believe it is our duty to uphold the integrity of our work. And somebody created a untoward patch of a game, and that led this guy um, from Tecmo to say this. But the game that had been released was Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. So if anybody has seen that game, I've obviously only done the top of the box cover for a reason. Um, and it is uh, high on the list of... Uh, double standards uh, that the producers of that game can talk about protecting the integrity of their game. But there, there is a certain uh, double standard um, that's not helpful to the debate. So you've got ID expression. You've got public-private in your mind. I just want to add a few more words as you go through this. Uh, personal, creativity, interactivity, environment. Are these the same in static media as they are for digital media? Do you look at those words the same way? Just hold the video. So when we talk about mods, there are some cases, and there's one Notable case, which I hope Greg will uh, will talk about, that never came to fruition, um, called the NCSoft case, where there was an action against a gaming company that made tools that would allow you to infringe um, a comic book company's copyrights. But didn't, the game itself didn't infringe. It just had tools that would allow for that. So what are the cases? MicroStar and FormGen. So MicroStar sold a CD-ROM called Nukip, which was a collection of 300 user-created levels. So this is created by users for free, posted on the net, harvested by a company and commercially sold without permission of the people who made those levels. 
no real surprise that they lost. The irony was that MicroStar tried to argue that the end user license agreement in favor of the people who built the levels, which allowed them to build those levels, somehow protected it, court said, no. But in doing that, arguably created some damage to the notion of modding. But remember, MicroStar was not a modder. They didn't build a single level. They didn't have any form of creativity other than in whatever their promotional materials were in repackaging. Davidson's a key case. We'll come back to it many times. Um, but it has to do with Blizzard creating a multiplayer tool called Battle.net, which arguably didn't work so well in its early days and had uh, commercial advertising and other things. And a community got together, reverse engineered Battle.net, created its own tool called BNETD, which worked apparently quite well, and Blizzard sued. And Blizzard succeeded. And they succeeded based on non-intellectual property law, which allows reverse engineering, but based on their end user license agreement and terms of use. So they succeeded based on contract. And that's a preview to the next couple of weeks. And then Galoob and Nintendo, um, this is a Game Genie case, um, which allowed gameplay features to be modified without modifying code. Court found that to be fair use. iRacing and Robinson, this was a mod. Uh, this is probably the most difficult case. Um, this was a mod that went right to the core of iRacing's code and their proprietary code. And arguably was quite competitive or could become quite competitive with what iRacing's business plan was um, in 2007. They hadn't yet launched. And the court, even then, protected fair use and said, we are not stopping Robinson based on fair use or on copyright. We're stopping him based on breach of contract. And that's a key distinction. And sadly, that key distinction is going to become more and more important because if there's one thing I'll probably succeed at in this class is getting you really, really concerned about all the things you're not reading in all the end user license agreements that you're agreeing to. Because, and this will be the message in the next couple of weeks, they vastly reorganize intellectual property law. Sim similarly, MDY and Blizzard this was the bot case. So Blizzard tried to protect against bots. MDY came up with a technology called Glider, which circumvented the protection and allowed bots in the game. And here, you had the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So you had a statutory provision that came. Which we now have. We do. Canadian Copyright Act. And the most recent 
copyright, uh, the Copyright Modernization Act brought in the anti-disabling um, provisions um, that are, were in the DMCA. Now, what we have in the MDY case, though, is the court again bending over as much as it can in a positive way, and trying to help out in protecting fair use by saying MDY was the culprit, but a gamer who uses this technology and this workaround is okay, is in the clear, is not infringing. So the company who made it, the dealer, if you will, is culpable, not the user. Glider users are not copyright infringers. All right, so how do we make sense of these cases? And how do we make sense of them in the context of modding? And what do they allow for? So copyright law is only directly implicated in Microstar and Galoob. Microstar, I mean, had nothing to do with creators. It, the creation belonged to the users and was, permit, and was permissible. It was, um, you know, somebody making money off of creators without so much as acknowledging them. And the Game Genie case is a good fair use case. Everything else is contract law. And the real point is that there is nothing in the cases, and I'll come back at length to the BNETD case in week 10 or 11, I think week 11, to prove this to you. But there's nothing in the cases that doesn't protect a creative act. So if you isolate the, the actual acts of creation, and this is where BNETD gets a bit weird, because what the court seemed to accept in oral argument, and what Blizzard was arguing in oral argument, was now this is just technology stuff. What these what the what the community was doing was not a creative act. It was simply a technological act. It was some version of plugging in a toaster, which of course is not right, but they were so afraid of acknowledging that there was creativity in building a tool like that. And in a way, they did modding a favor. Because none of these cases deal with real creation and real creative tools. And where they do, they're, they're, like the Game Genie case, it's arguably protected. So my conclusion that I suggest to you, which what you can accept or not, is that there's no current precedent that game mods are not fair use. It's a negative statement, not a positive one. Also means that there's no positive statement that they are fair use, although we're getting close. So here's what's at stake. Mods, machinima, fan fiction, remixing of music, multi-source content, the latest being 3D printing. This is uh, by colleague Kimberly Vol's 3D printer. Uh, and my picture of it, and what can you create? So, we come back to another theme of the course, shared creativity, interactivity, does that change the equation? 
John, there's a there, 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 there's a the problem that I seem to have, and it may be because I'm a bit slow, but it's in removing the whole notion of looking at patent law. Patent law is very different from copyright law. Patent law does have a right of creativity or innovation. You can do an improvement patent. You may be you know, uh, prescribed from being able to exploit it economically for the length of time of the work that you're working from. But if you do an improvement patent, you can, in fact, patent that improvement. And then it's up to you to license with whoever had the original patent. You can license each other to be able to exploit it before the 20 years of exclusivity. And that's how patent law works on this kind of innovation. And there is a right there which is recognized by the Patent Act which allows you to patent a derivative patent based on the fact that with patent, you have to provide the best and the you know the best way of, of, of using the particular invention and innovation. But in patent law, if somebody comes up with an improvement, they can still get a patent. They can they get just a patent. can't use it economically in the marketplace without licensure from the original right. patent owner. Um, and that's sort of the way that it's handled in patent. But that's because with the patent register, you have to put everything out on how to, you know, you reverse engineering isn't necessary. So, so let me try and address your concern two ways. The, the first and m most obvious one is there aren't a lot, there have been a few patent cases in video gaming, but not very many and virtually none that have actually come to a decision. Um, so it, it does form part of the pleadings occasionally, um, but almost all the cases are around copyright. The other way of addressing it to me is patent sets a fairly high threshold to get the, the initial patent. So there, so there, and copyright, as we've talked about, creates a very low threshold. Because and, of the diminished, diminished right. formalities. And, and, and so that, but that difference in formalities makes a huge difference, or should make a huge difference, in the ability to do derivative works and the threshold at which derivative works can be done. Patent, the, the patent system very much is a system. It creates a threshold, and it's far clearer about its objectives, I would argue, uh, than copyright law. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll try and address it a um, little bit, a, 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 hopefully a little bit more uh, in depth um, as we go on in the next sort of 10 minutes. Um, another thing I want you to focus on when we're talking about modding and creativity and authors is the difference between a right to create and what we have now, which is a right to or a right in the creation. So when you look at intellectual property law, philosophically it's worth asking yourself, is this really an author's right or is this a right in the corpus? So when I talk about a right to create and a right to mod, it's, it's an expressive right. And it becomes very easy to turn the corner from this is an expressive right to this is a right in the expression. And that's what happens here. And there is a way of parsing that out and making it, it different all of which leads to a slide you've seen before, and that's what are you going to value more. And it's your decision, but where you come down to on this question is going to determine where you are more likely than not on the question of both. And, you know, I, I won't spend any real time on this, but let's not forget how important the that creativity is, and in particular, I want to 
talk about the chilling effect of being told you can't create. And Salman Rushdie expresses it. Well, if the creative artist worries he will still be free tomorrow, then he will not be free today. Um, and I don't know if anybody's been reading any of the gut-wrenching stuff from the woman uh, in Pussy Riot who's uh, engaging in a hun hunger strike in a Russian jail. Um, but, you know, it's, it's pretty awful. Um, we're all creatives. Uh, when I was eight years old, I started drawing comic books, which I'm sure were a complete breach of copyright and in, a, in someone's literalist mind. Uh, I was a big Spider-Man fan. I have returned to Spider-Man, although I'm really not happy with the whole Doc Ock um, superior Spider-Man thing, but we'll see. They've killed off Peter Parker. Sorry if that's a spoiler for you guys. Um, and I came back to drawing a little bit in memory of that. I will just invite you to think a little bit about intellectual property as words and whether they make sense together as words. Um, I also did and would invite you to do the same. Look for the word copy, or look for the word property in the Canadian Copyright Act. You will not find it except in tangential other meanings. You will not find it as meaning, as meaning property. You will, ironically, find it in the Patent Act, meaning property. And it's very interesting to look through and examine how much the notion of intellectual property is in fact a meme, much more than it is law but it's a very influential meme because it, it frames for us what copyright is. And it frames it as property. And there's lots of reasons. Uh, the, the, the one that, that Ken um, cites, which I always love, is you know the Statute of Anne in 1710, was an act to encourage learning. The US Constitution talks about promoting the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a time the rights of authors. So the goal is always greater knowledge. And the question in the digital age is whether that's being served. And if you're being literal, and as some are about intellectual property rights, then maybe we should be literal about copyright. Because maybe copyright should just mean the right to copy. Nobody should be able to plagiarize your work. We're not talking about plagiarism, and we're not talking at any point here about you know, making illegal copies of a Blu-ray, you know, making 20,000 illegal copies of a Blu-ray and selling that. That's not modding. That's not remixing. That's out-and-out -out theft. And I don't think anybody really argues that. And then one other semi-original piece of research, because I haven't seen this anywhere else. This is is something I went through. If you look at copyright and you look at the statute of Anne and you look at it in the context of what, what went before it, what you find is something really interesting. So the statute of Anne was the first British proper, uh, copyright statute. And what you in fact find is that originally the king could prohibit you from publishing anything the king didn't want you to publish. And printing presses were completely controlled 
by the king. And then over time, there was a liberalization of that. And control went from the king to parliament, and from parliament essentially to a guild. But it never moved to the author. There was always this sort of regulatory mechanism or completely arbitrary mechanism of, uh, of the king's fiat above your creative right. And your work might not see the light of day simply based on what somebody else thought until the statute of Anne. And if you think about it, and it's hard for us to place ourselves in 1710, but if you think about it, the only way to create an author's right to fully express themselves and fully publish something would be to give them sovereignty over the work. And of course, that would imply property as well. So when I look at the Statute of Anne, weirdly enough, I see it as part of the history of freedom of expression. I don't see it as a property act. I see it as the only way that an author could get published just because they wanted to. Oh. Which takes us back to authors. So, and one other question related to all this, which hit me yesterday. And that is, if I'm right, and I may not be, but if the statute of Anne was part of this trajectory of liberalization, then when freedom of expression and freedom of speech came along, what were you going to do with the author's rights? It's kind of logical that it would have bifurcated itself into a property right. So there's a book in there somewhere. But there's also a troubling question of whether we've done very much conceptually since 1710, leading to why the digital age is creating such a need for catch-up. I'll deal with this next week, but I want you to think about Carlos Condit. Carlos Condit went to a tattoo artist. He's a UFC fighter, got a tattoo done, he then signed a contract with EA, no, uh, Activision, uh, among many other UFC fighters, uh, for the rights for his image to appear in the UFC game. And the creator of the tattoo sued Activision, saying, that's my art in your game. Yes, you have accurately, very accurately recreated Carlos Condit. Now, where are my royalties? Cases are going. There's an Argentinian precedent, which I'll talk about from 2009. You guys can look it up, but I'll share it with you next week. Uh, but I do want you to think about this kind of, you know, Escher-like drawing of, you know, things that lead into each other and play mind tricks with you. That's why I've got the, the issue thing. So how do we move forward? Now, let me see how much time I have to do this. Oh, good. I have almost six minutes. Um, obviously, one way is right to create, right to remix as a user's right. Now, is that realistic?
I mentioned it last week. I'll mention it again this week. We've seen this kind of revolution before, Sony and Universal. And that created the notion of time shifting, which allowed for digital video, for, for um, VCRs, for video recorders. They weren't digital at the time. Today, maybe time shifting in a digital world becomes just context shifting. So if you want to create a mod, you're changing a context. You're not threatening somebody else's intellectual property directly. Now, there are some principles that come out of Sony. The most relevant one that I want you to focus on is that there was no impairment of, of Sony's copyright value in time shifting. Well, Supreme Court of Canada has done a whole bunch of this for us. The August 2012 copyright pentology, pretty proactive on users' rights. We talked about Crooks and Newton and the right to link. Uh, they established a principle of tech neutrality, which you think you think about it philosophically, takes us uh, to a helpful place in the digital age. And I think that the quote that jumps out of all of the cases for me is fair dealing is a user's right and the relevant perspective when considering whether the dealing is for an allowable purpose is that of the user. Not of the copyright holder, but of the user. Are you dealing with the copyright fairly? Not does the copyright holder think you are dealing with it fairly. That's a giant shift. That is users' rights. Now you start looking at mods through that prism and you might see something different. And also, just as a reminder, we have a new provision in Canada, which is for non-commercial user-generated content. And there's a whole bunch of criteria solely for non-commercial, but I want to point you to D. If you're doing this, whatever you're doing, which can include modding, clearly, does not have a substantial adverse effect on the existing work. So we're sort of back to Sony and universal principles. Other ways of doing it, raise the thresholds for copyright protection. Instead of making it so easy to get copyright, make it more like patents. Um, another way of looking at it in the digital age is we're all creators. This is all just barter. We're just all sharing our works with each other. Now, that's a bit far flung, but there you go. And then the dream for the technologists among you, and that is somebody creates an algorithm that if you're a sharer, you get shared with. And if you're not a sharer, you can't access other people's stuff. Then moral rights, which I keep teasing you with, and we'll elaborate on towards the end of the course, and a bunch of wonderful authorities for you to go to if you're writing papers in the area. But I do want to mention um, Nathaniel Poor's paper which is not a law paper, but a pure video game research paper. But what you need to know is he examined why do people mod. And they don't mod primarily because they want to go into industry or they want to be hired by a video game company. And they don't mod because there's profit in it. They mod to be creators and to use their innate creativity for the most part. So it really does fit in. And now if you think about the Supreme Court of Canada and the perspective of the creator, the perspective of the user, the perspective of the modder being important, that's a pretty important result. Because the core question does become, why are you modding? 
And if you're modding to express your creativity, that's a pretty good place to start. So this is my allusion to Grand Prix Legends. The obvious answer is, if I had any technical skills, I could mod. <laughs> and since I don't, I actually can't. Um, and we are almost done. We've got Greg Listoka, who is going to join us uh, momentarily. I am actually on time. Come on in. We're ready to switch. And Greg will actually continue the discussion. Before we do that, we should also... So there's, off, there's always been a, a, a slightly different approach to whether or not um, infringement is something which is theft, which is a term which is quite often expressed by so-called authors or rights holders at any rate. And, and, and I do want to mention, you know, there's a couple of Canadian papers um, in the Useful Authorities, which you'll see, one by Teresa Scazza, and another by Robert Tomkowicz of the Ottawa, which is called Equitable Ownership of Copyright, Copyright in Ideas. So, you know, these, these things are, are, are being challenged. Um, I'm just going to dial them out. You go right ahead. Do whatever you need to do. Um, should mention, um, by way of uh, apologies for, for, for Nan and I, um, that last week's videos gnawed up. There was, it was a very busy week at the law school, and then there was a, uh, an attack on the system yesterday. It's up um, now, actually. So I'll get, uh, I'll get last week's up uh, today, and uh, hopefully this one up. Hi, now. There we go. Hello. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Good. I'm just getting my slides up here. All right. And if necessary, I can get... Do you want me to get his slides no, up here? We'll, we'll wait to see if... Okay, right. we should be sending the two feeds. Right. We're going to see if yours come up. Can you see the class, Greg? Or can you... I can see... Yeah, I can see uh, you. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you're coming... From Is that Daniel? Yeah, I guess that's... Okay. <laughs> That's, is there a way of getting this camera to work so Greg can see? Uh, only if one of the mics over there is on. Okay, well, we'll turn on one of those. Uh, I'm not seeing the slides, Greg. That's fixable. Yeah, you've got them here, John? Oh, yeah. there it is. Okay, okay we got it. It is to the right? Yeah, okay. Excellent. Yeah. There we go. Nope, it went away. All right, so I, I will just. That was good for we had it for a second, right? That layout. Yeah, let's choose that. The wonderful and amazing Greg Lascoca. He's also playing with it. Okay. Oh yeah, he just broke it on the class. Right? Yeah. So when he's done. But yeah, see it's all I have to figure out what the hell. Because I did manage to call him back. I was like, oh yeah, I just should do blank or blank. I probably made a note of it somewhere, but where that is is beyond me. Greg, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, John. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to briefly introduce you. Um, and your slides are up, and the class sees you. I'm afraid you're going to have to see me, because we can't, uh, unless I can figure out how to get the right camera onto the class. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, Greg has been, uh, I, is in my view, the leading uh, academic, real academic in the world of video game law and has been that for a long time. And it is our privilege uh, to have him here. And I will turn it over to Greg. And Greg, you've got about 40 minutes. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I, th I think my uh, computer battery, I just got a new MacBook, so uh, the, uh, I forgot to bring the power cord. So hopefully <laughs> the presentation will last for 40 minutes. And thank you for that very kind uh, Introduction. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, actually three different things: uh, user-generated content, 
copyright law and user-generated content, and then an empirical project that I'm working on uh, right now. And uh, usually uh, I break up this presentation into one of the three various parts, but I think uh, with 40 minutes I should be able to do uh, uh, a nice kind of synergistic approach. So uh, that's good. Um, if anybody wants to interrupt at any point to ask any questions, um, I'd be glad to do that. And John, are we going to do Q&A after the 40 minutes? Is that yeah, the plan? Let, we will do Q&A for, uh, for the extra 10 minutes. It's just that the automatic okay. camera turns off, so uh, okay. we, we will do that. Sounds good. Okay. So without further ado then. Um, so first part on user-generated content. I'm going to start with a, a, a personal anecdote, and, and uh, this is uh, my family union, or half of my family's reunion. Um, obviously, my last name's not O'Malley, but uh, uh, I'm mostly Irish, and this is a family reunion in, in New Jersey uh, as of last summer. Um, and the thing that, uh, you know, about the O'Malley family reunion of, is that nobody actually, uh, during the family reunion, actually watched uh, as far as I know, any movies or, or read books. Basically, these were relatives from across the country who were gathering together to just kind of exchange stories. And we spent, you know, two days just kind of hanging out together, catching on, up on family history. We actually did play some games. We, uh, you know, had some trivia contests, uh, Irish bread uh, baking contest. Uh, we had uh, uh, a bunch, like a, a foot race, did a bunch of different things and just kind of enjoyed each other's company. Um, And now, I'll, I'll certainly come back to that in a, in a, in a minute or two. Um, I want to talk about uh, another bit of personal history. Um, the picture on the right there in the PowerPoint slide uh, is me in 1982, I believe. Uh, and I was uh, on an early system, uh, probably not connected to the World Wide Web, but at that time at home using an Apple II computer, I was connected to not the World Wide Web, the, the Internet. Uh, and basically using the Internet to chat with people who were uh, in distant states uh, in other parts of the country, uh, in other parts of the world, actually. Um, and this is just to stress that in the early 80s, there was uh, an Internet, and it was used for chat. It was used for sharing documents. It was actually started in, in uh, the late 1960s. Uh, and even uh, in the mid-1970s, the picture on the left there is my friend Richard Bartle, uh, who created um, what's arguably the first uh, massively multiplayer game, uh, MUD, uh, on a, a computer in, in England. And so people were using the Internet to play uh, multiplayer games, uh, text-based games, of course, uh, back in the uh, 1970s. I used the Internet uh, in the 1980s, as did a lot of other people, uh, to to do chat uh, communications. Also, a very popular form of communication during the 1980s using personal computers was modem-based bulletin board systems, which were uh, essentially, uh, you know, personal computers, you'd open up your computer via modem link to host uh, text files um, and uh, kind of discussion boards. And people would dial uh, into your system using the modem and kind of leave messages on the system. And this is the uh, origin, as far as I can tell, uh, of the concept of uh, user-generated uh, content. Um, this slide's uh, Alvin Toffler, uh, who is a, uh, and, and was a, a futurist, uh, who uh, wrote a book in 1980, which I think is very interesting in, in light of what I'm going to be talking about um, if you look at the quote there, uh, he is talking about video games, and he's probably talking about the Atari 2600 uh, at the time, um, because that was probably synonymous with like home video games at the time. He says, it, well, part of his claim was that we were turning into, from being consumers to prosumers, that we were kind of proactive in our consumption habits, and we were kind of shaping uh, the uh, products that we were uh, consuming and not just merely passively receiving them. And he... Uh, in this one chapter of his book, uh, the, the Third Wave suggested that video games were actually changing the nature of media. And if you look at the quote there, he's saying, uh, millions of people are learning to play with the television set, to talk back to it, to interact with it, 
In the process, they're changing from passive receivers to message senders as well. They're manipulating the set rather than merely letting that set manipulate them. So there was a sense in 1980, right, that um, video games were a form of participation in the media landscape that had not been seen before, a kind of technological change enabling participation. Um, I also found this, and this is the first instance I have found so far of the term user-generated content used in its contemporary meaning, but this is from 1989, uh, and this is from Carrie Heater, actually does a lot of work on uh, gamification and serious games now. Um, but she wrote uh, in a collection of essays in 1989 on changes in, in media uh, that these new technologies um, were allowing users, essentially, to contribute content to media systems. So she's saying here, uh, in the quote that I have there, electronic bulletin boards are computer-based systems that link users by telephone to public message databases comprised almost entirely of user-generated content. And there's the word user-generated content. And she's saying that, you know, this is a shift. Uh, in the past, we had, you know, users who would receive you know, content, kind of echoing Toffler, and today we have users who are generating the content on these technological systems. So what this, you know, is suggesting is that user-generated content is a shift from one-to-many media, as, as kind of Clay Shirky um, uh, called it uh, in the early 20th century, to many-to-many -to -many media, uh, where uh, the typical communications model was based upon the broadcaster sending the, the message to the audience, um, and now we're actually having the audience talking back to the broadcaster. And if you think about, um, uh, you know, the uh, I have you know a phonograph player, or a television set, newspaper, uh, radio. In these other kind of broadcast models, of course, there were situations where individuals would talk back, you know, to the medium in the sense of, you know, having a man on the street interview on a television station, having a letter to the editor appear in the newspaper, a call-in show uh, on the radio. There were instances where the general public could, you know, in fact, appear on a broadcast medium and have control over their creative expression to some extent. But it was dominated by kind of prepackaged content, professionally created content that was sold uh, to uh, audiences via broadcast or via copies of content. So that's the notion of user generated content. I just want to make it problematic here for a second because I think um, there's justifiable criticism of the very concept of user generated content. Even the word itself seems to embody some misunderstandings. So, um, what is user-generated content? Well, a user, why do we use the term user? I think the reason that Heater used the term user uh, is that she was speaking from the language of computer science where uh, computer users were separated from computer creators. The, the technology was created and then um, the user was seen as you know, a focus of uh, kind of design uh, challenges, a focus of uh, you know, it's a common terminology for someone who used a personal computer. But in the context of user-generated content, um, we're, what we're saying is that the individuals that are using the technology, the, the World Wide Web or the Internet, um, in, in, in this case, uh, or any kind of technology, are categorized as users. If we think about that more broadly, you know, the, the, the people that were, you know, um, sending the broadcasters that were sending messages over television, over radio, were users themselves, right? They are users of a technology. It's just that they were uh, a kind of, you know, privileged uh, uh, users who had control and ownership of the of the of the uh, media technology, and the audience was seen as differentiated. That they were, you know, uh, they were um, receiving the message, but they, you know, were not capable of sending the message back. So. Um, I'm not sure the term users is right. Some people have critiqued it and said, you know, we're not, we're, everybody uses technology, um, all individuals, so why are we characterizing these people who we really, you know, are speakers or authors, why are we characterizing them as users in this case? And um, content is another problematic term, arguably. Um, content kind of makes sense under this model in that um, you want to attract an audience, so you fill your you know, commercial channel with some kind of you know, meaningful content that's going to attract an audience. But um, in, the, in, the, in the context of 
um, user-generated content, often we're talking about chat room conversations, uh, activity on discussion boards. Um, we're talking about information, but are we talking about content that kind of fills uh, a vessel or content that is kind of similar to broadcast content? Arguably, we're not. Um, and, you know, even today, sometimes user-generated content is talked about um, as even uh, user behavior on systems. So when you uh, you know, like something on Facebook or when you visit a particular website and they can track, you know, what your activity was, that is user-generated content because it's content, it's, you know, information that has value to the person that owns the platform. That is not content in the typical model of authorship being produced. It's just information. So there's some problems in the term. There's some other terms being used. I'm just sticking with user-generated content because um, it's uh, kind of the oldest and it doesn't require me to form an allegiance with any particular uh, pundit at the moment. So let's fast forward to the 1990s, uh, get away from bulletin board systems and uh, into the, the World Wide Web, you know, which was created uh, in 1994, uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, this is X Excite, uh, the search engine from 1999. Um, and the term user-generated content, even though we have the birth of the World Wide Web and we have the birth of search engines and we have you know, a lot of websites being created, is not very commonly used at the time, and it's not creating that much interest. If you looked, it's probably too small to see on, this, on the screen there, but a lot of the um, focus in the 1990s was on using the Internet as a content delivery platform. And a lot of the focus of you know, early companies like Excite, uh, and, and Yahoo was on partnering with the broadcast media to get the best content that they could deliver to users. There was kind of a dim awareness that you know users were interested in communicating with each other, but they're given the constraints on upload speeds, given the constraints on uh, you know the type of media that could be exchanged. Images still took a lot of time to download. Um, there were constraints on um, how much you could have users actually creating works that they could share with each other. So on this screen, on this Excite screen, which is kind of the, the splash page when you land on Excite, um, they're advertising chat, and chat rooms were important, but not a lot of uh, kind of anything like YouTube uh, or the kind of user-generated content we have today. Um, so even though the technological capacity was there, even though the practices were there, it seems as if it takes until maybe about um, 10 years ago, this is a 2006 uh, Time Magazine cover, um, that's that often talked about where uh, Time says the person of the year is you, that in the new kind of online media landscape, you are the center and it's your voice that's being heard. And this is the, uh, you know, what they're talking about there is YouTube, of course, that's a homage to YouTube on the, uh, you know, the cover of the magazine because it actually has the play bar from, from YouTube, but also um, uh, blogs and other forms of social media were kind of just emerging in 2006. So in addition to user-generated content, we have terms like mass amateurization, uh, Web 2.0 as part of this, participatory culture by Henry Jenkins at MIT, uh, peer production by Yokai Benkler, now teaches at uh, Harvard, uh, user innovation, uh, Von Hippel, who teaches at Harvard too. Axel Brun's uh, Producage is uh, his term that he came up with. Lawrence Lessig talks about remix culture. Uh, uh, Aaron Steinrich uh, at, at Rutgers talks about configurable culture. There's a, there's a ton of different, I left out Wikonomics, a ton of different terms to choose from, um, but they're basically all describing the same phenomenon where, you know, the same one that Heater, Heater described back in the 80s, which was uh, on these technological platforms, the uh, individuals who are contributing to the platform uh, are uh, creating media that's rivaling the, the uh, media created by professionals. Um, so um, with that, I can move on to, that's the, the phenomenon that we're talking about. How does that phenomenon relate to copyright law? So um, you know this, how, how much, uh, I don't know how much review I need to do of uh, copyright basics, John, and, and IP. I, I don't know that you have to do a whole lot. What I would maybe ask you to do is um, relate to video games in, in, in any particular way. And uh, I think I wrote you an email. Just if you could talk a little bit about NCSoft, that would be cool. Okay, great. Okay, so I, I will do that. Um, so uh, 
my, my point with this slide is that copyright protects uh, certain forms of authorship, right? So when you relate user-generated content to copyright law, you're talking about certain practices, user practices, that would fall within the realm of copyright, uh, and that arguably user-generated content is broader uh, than that. Uh, I'll just briefly say that, that copyright is, is uh, a technological phenomenon as well, that it was created essentially in response to the printing press, uh, and that it's expanded to adapt to new technologies. So um, the early you know, uh, history of copyright law um, was uh, arguably an uh, attempt to institute a state form of censorship over printing, and the uh, uh, evolution of copyright into the modern age is kind of premised on a theory that authors need incentives to create, um, that without copyright protection, you'll have an insufficient supply of authorship. Um, so uh, that's what this slide is about, the notion, the traditional copyright model, that there's an industry that takes the creative output of professionals and distributes it to the public, and that this industry of, of printers and intermediaries is very important. And in the United States, at least, uh, Congress has historically, Jessica Littman has a book about this, tended, uh, tended to regard the entertainment industry as the, as the client of copyright legislation, that basically when new copyright legislation comes up, it's the industry in Hollywood, uh, the recording industry that goes to Congress and helps to draft the new copyright laws. Um, I, this is a, actually, I was looking at this slide. I think it's wrong. Um, I said these are non-controversial technologies. Actually, <laughs> these are all intensely controversial technologies. So I just talked about the printing press and newspapers. That was the basis, you know, for the formation of copyright law. The radio created huge copyright controversies. So did uh, recorded music uh, and television as well. Uh, what I mean is that with respect to users, uh, and especially in the late 20th century, these, you know, the controversies over these particular technologies had largely been ironed out and incorporated into the copyright statute. The things that were creating problems were these user technologies. So the photocopy machine, home cassette audio taping, uh, the VCR, anything by which the public could make copies. The public did not previously have the ability to make perfect copies of books, of, of movies, of, of music. And now they had that in their hands, so there was this concern. And this is a quote from Jack Valenny that the VCR is the American film producer as the Boston Stranglers to the woman alone, right? That these are, these are incredibly dangerous uh, technologies to the copyright industry. Um, so the approach to these new technologies was to essentially expand the penalties for piracy, to say to consumers, Look, we know you have these technologies now, so we're going to criminalize copyright infringement, we're going to strengthen enforcement, we're going to expand uh, copyright entitlements to kind of minimize the impact, the harmful impact of, of piracy. Because we will give you a product, we'll give you music, and then you'll tape it and give it to your friends, so we need to have stronger protections for uh, professional authorship. The thing that's interesting is the internet um, and... You know, even in, if you go back to the pre-internet of the 1950s, um, when the kind of uh, people like uh, Vannevar Bush or or, um, or uh, Licklider were uh, anticipating the internet, the whole goal was to enable collaboration and enable fast, efficient, simple copying of information and sharing across like huge geographic expanses, right? So you wanted to be able to collapse space and enable people to share information quickly and efficiently, and that's how they built this entire architecture. So as a result, right, the, the approach of the content industries to the Internet was that this is a huge photocopy machine, that uh, basically what you've enabled is for people to take our stuff and to copy it and to share it with other people, and you need to do something about this because if, if you don't do it, uh, we are going to... You know, have our industries tanked by all of the unauthorized copying that's going on. So, um, as a result, you know, when the, when the internet becomes popular, you see a uh, passage of new laws designed to create digital rights management protections. You see a lot of new laws designed to criminalize non-commercial copyright infringement. You see um, lawsuits against uh, intermediaries. Uh, and Congress, again, is generally sympathetic to the industry groups. Um, which is one way of viewing the effect of the internet on copyright, but the other effect, um, to go back to the O'Malley Family Reunion, right? If the O'Malley Family Reunion is done on Facebook, and it, it actually was planned on Facebook, uh, and to some extent it was, you know, um, 
uh, debriefed on, on Facebook. Um, a lot of you know, communications with my family occur through Facebook, right? So people are constantly uploading pictures. They're constantly telling stories. You know, they're constantly linking to commentary. Um, so if we are all online and sharing information with each other online, uh, it would seem to me that this is a, another kind of copyright crisis, but it's a crisis of copyright authorship that we have all become authors. So this idea that network can facilitate amateur authorship uh, is you know, arguably just as important to copyright law as um, the uh, concerns about piracy. Um, how should copyright approach amateur authorship? Uh, and it's something that uh, a lot of copyright theorists have talked about. Uh, Lessig, Bankler, uh, and, and Jenkins are, are up there, um, who all written about this this issue. Okay, so um, with that, now I'm going to focus in on on uh, video games, uh, particularly. So what happened about a year ago was that uh, I started a research project funded by the National Science Foundation on. Uh, video games, other forms of user-generated content, and copyright law. Um, and I had a, a pretty large research team helping me out with this. A bunch of students helped. Um, so it's an empirical investigation of user-generated content practices on a variety of platforms, including games, kind of with a focus on games. And what we were looking for is to, to discover data, just to kind of understand the nature of practices, UGC practices in video game uh, uh, arenas, and how they intersect with copyright law policy. So uh, this is just you know my prior research. I've been writing about copyright law and writing about video games for a long time, but this is when I'm kind of combining the two uh, together. So part of my problem with the existing research on user-generated content is that much of the legal writing in this area was um, premised on anecdotes. So you had you know, people just constantly saying, well, Wikipedia demonstrates X, right? Or the Grey album is an example of remix creativity, so therefore you know, copyright law should do X. Or, or Girl Talk, Greg Gillis. Or the Stephanie Lenz case about the dancing toddler. Or, or Counter-Strike was created by modders, so therefore um, X, right? And my concern was that, well, these are you know, interesting individual cases, but are they representative of the general way in which the public is using these new platforms for creativity? So is it true that everybody uses YouTube to do mashups? Is it true that everybody you know, uh, is contributing to Wikipedia? Uh, is it true that all modders are basically trying to create the next Counter-Strike? Um, so I wanted to figure that out. Uh, Another you know, concern was that the percentage, you know, the exact percentage of a platform that's being used for what could be infringing activity tends to have a lot of legal relevance um, to multiple areas of law. Uh, and, and, the, and the way that um, uh, the, the, the content uh, is being used, if it's um, remix creativity, it may fall under the United States law under a fair use categorization. If it's just kind of um, uh, blatant reproduction uh, and transmission, then it's piracy and then would be necessarily infringing. So that can have an effect. So getting the exact numbers and kind of understanding very clearly what the practices are can be legally important. And um, uh, so I, John wanted me to talk about this case. I was involved uh, with an amicus brief uh, in this case. Uh, Marvel versus NCSoft, and I think it, you know, it nicely tees up my involvement in that case, and um, I wrote about it uh, in my book, uh, was also a motivation in my getting uh, involved in this project, the, the uh, Player Office project. And, and NCSoft created, actually with Cryptic Studios, a video game called City of Heroes, where uh, essentially whenever you played, you started uh, by creating your avatar, a character name, creating you know, uh, uh, some superpowers, choosing some superpowers for your, for your avatar, and creating a costume design for your superhero. So it's a superhero-based multiplayer online game set in you know, a pretty large uh, universe. You kind of run around fighting you know, supervillain bad guys. Eventually they added a city, city of Villains game where you could actually play a villain and then fight against other players who are playing the good guys. Um, but a key factor in, in the game, or you know, a, a key uh, appealing element of the game, was the character creation engine. So when you started, you got to create your superhero costume, and some people liked the character creation engine so much 
that they basically didn't play the game. They just spent their time creating new superhero costumes. And then they would all assemble in the kind of town square of Paragon City. Uh, and they would, um, all these different players, you know, had a lineup of like 30 people in, in custom created superhero costumes. And someone would be the judge. And the person who won the, cost, the costume contest would get some kind of, you know, in-game monetary reward, some kind of prize, you know, and, and some additional game tokens, right? Uh, so uh, players themselves decided, we're not going to play the game. We're not going to play the, the game that was designed for us. We're just going to play the creativity game, right? We're just going to use this as a costume design tool. Which is going, you know, is all well and good until Marvel Comics uh, gets wind of what's going on and they say, here's a adaptation of the comic book genre into the computer game genre. It's immensely popular and they've created this tool um, that allows players to design superhero costumes. Um, and, and normally I don't get into this, but because, you know, if, um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting and relevant. The terms of service of the City of Heroes game actually required the players, when they created a costume, not only to grant NCSoft a uh, non-exclusive license to use the, you know, the costume in any way they wanted, um, which is kind of the normal, you know, if you use Facebook, Facebook demands a uh, non-exclusive license to use everything you upload to the Facebook platform, so your photographs they can use, you know, basically as they want to. NCSoft actually demanded that when you used um, the City of Heroes game and uploaded the costume, you assigned copyright to NCSoft. So their license required an assignment. So basically, you were no longer the owner of your superhero costume. NCSoft was the owner of your superhero costume. So that was kind of aggressive, and uh, I, I can actually, in a way, understand why Marvel was concerned, right? Because basically what NCSoft has done is create a system whereby any new Marvel superhero character, NCSoft might be able to go through their database and say, hey, you're, this, you know, you're Marvel, your new superhero has you know, green tights and a, and a blue cape and a, you know, a, a, an R on the front of his chest, right? We've actually got a character that was created you know, back, way back when, and, uh, and we actually have an assignment of copyright in that character, and you infringe on our character, right? So Marvel could have been legitimately concerned that what NCSoft was doing was basically warehousing copyrights in a bazillion you know, new superhero costumes that had been originally created <laughs> by player authors, right? Um, so, um, so that's you know, to kind of be an apologist for Marvel. But the rest, the rest of the you know, description, I'm going to... I'm not really happy about what Marvel was doing. Marvel said, basically... NCSoft, you can't create this tool because it's a tool that can be used by players to infringe on the copyrights that Marvel has in its superheroes, right? So players can use your character creation engine to create a Wolverine lookalike or an Iron Man lookalike or a, you know, uh, you know whatever, any kind of Marvel superhero lookalike. And then they actually included uh, in the, the legal filings a screenshot of a bunch of Marvel uh, superheroes, including Superman, who is a DC <laughs> superhero, um, but just kind of showed up anyway, uh, in, the, in the complaint as an example of infringement that they said was rampant in Paragon City. Now, having actually played the game a little bit, uh, this struck me as extremely odd because if you actually played the game and you understood how important it was for players to kind of differentiate themselves, if you actually appeared as Wolverine in the game, chances are nobody would have actually have respect for you. They'd say, you're you know, infringing the, the, the Wolverine you know, copyright. You're not doing anything original. That's just a ripoff. You know, go and create yourself a better costume. Right? So it was really deeply unpopular to not be original in the, in the City of Heroes game. So it seemed very unlikely that there would be a collection of Marvel superheroes all kind of standing together you know, in a group, as the screenshot showed. It turned out that actually Marvel's lawyers had created the screenshot. They had logged into the game and created infringing content and then submitted it to the court as an example of what the players were doing, right? So after the court found out that basically it was a lawyer-created document that was submitted as evidence, um, the case settled. But Marvel's claim, just to be clear, was that this technology that they're, you know, that they're distributing enables players to infringe our copyrights by you know, creating you know, similar uh, characters. And interestingly, when um, NCSoft moved to dismiss and said, this is just like a, a toolkit, this is a box of crayons, 
Um, uh, the court, the, the district court, considering the case, said no. There seems to be a plausible claim here that you know the NCSoft's uh, technology is enabling, contributing to user infringement, and that NCSoft is profiting, you know, by selling a game that allows for user infringement. So it was willing to allow that to proceed to trial. And the procedural posture was, you know, motion to dismiss, so it wasn't a very rigorous standard, but the court didn't just dismiss it. It said, you know, there, there might be a claim here, a basis for uh, copyright infringement, uh, secondary liability on the part of NCSoft. And then another interesting thing about this case, right, was that Marvel sues NCSoft, for secondary liability on part on, on, on um, and claims that the infringements are being committed by the players, right? So the players are the ones being accused of copyright infringement. NCSoft is just accused of facilitating player infringement, but the players weren't parties before the court. And that's why I intervened in the case and I said, you know, look, the players aren't being represented here. Here's an argument on behalf of fair use, you know, on, on the part of the players uh, under copyright law. But like I said, the case was settled. Okay. It raises the interesting question, is it legal under copyright law to distribute technologies that enable player authorship when the player authorship may infringe on copyright law? So that was one of the motivations to take a look at what was happening in the user-generated content sphere. Another motivation was Minecraft. Um, and I was just kind of fascinated by this game. Um, you know, I, I explained uh, the history. John, did you distribute that, uh, that essay? Yes. On, on, yes, I, yeah, I put it, it's on. It was on the website, and hopefully, uh, at least some people. Well, I'm getting nods that uh, many people did read it. So, okay, great. So that's I, I, I've made my case there. Um, in that, you know, Nosh is a member of the pirate party. He doesn't like really kind of understand what he's doing, but the players just take this game and go wild with it because it has such rich creative affordances, right? And and he basically does not do anything to prevent it. So it's a huge phenomenon created by a small indie, you know, designer from Sweden. And, you know, it's taken on this kind of, you know, worldwide significance. And what's interesting is that this did not come from the AAA studios like, you know, like Bethesda, you know, like like Bungie. This is like a... a um, indie game that is, has gone huge, and I think the reason it's been so successful is because of the creative affordances it offers to players. Um, so uh, there's a lot of literature on uh, user-generated content in games. Um, I mentioned some of the legal scholars before. There are actually a bunch of people in game studies itself uh, who are, have written about uh, papers about uh, forms of productive play. So non-legal scholars writing about user-generated content. Um, so the, the last bit there, John Banks uh, from QUT uh, in, in Australia, Sal Humphreys also from Australia, Hector Pastigo uh, nearby here in the Temple, Ali Satana and Hannah Mormon are the kind of the main scholars and game studies that are interested in this. Um, none of them are lawyers. Um, so the, the uh, questions I was setting out to, to answer so are the anecdotal accounts that we get from Lessig and other scholars really representative of the general practice of UGC in, in video games? And my, my finding, my tentative finding at this point is generally no. Uh, is derivative UGC, is like UGC based upon known intellectual properties more popular than wholly original UGC, like so non-referential user-generated content? And generally, surprisingly, no. It doesn't seem like uh, fan works are any more popular than original works. Uh, is UGC generally transformative? So if you actually have a fan work, you know, is it going to be one that is remixing or parodying or, you know, kind of poking fun at the original uh, or, you know, kind of commenting critically on the original work? Generally, no. Most fan works are just fan works, right? They're not actually trying to uh, transform uh, the original work. Uh, and what are the motivational characteristics of UGC creators? Um, Generally, they're doing it for, because they enjoy it, because it's fun. They're not doing it because they think that they're going to make money off of it. So that seems to contradict the copyright premise that nobody but a blockhead would write except for money, um, uh, going back to Johnson. Um, platforms do seem to matter. PC-based games tend to have a lot more uh, user-generated content practices, uh, and using a PC, uh, playing on the PC, means that you're a lot more interested in user-generated content practices. Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, it seems to be more about the communities uh, than it does seem to be about the technological affordances, right? So you create an a, a, a authorship platform, 
And then what really seems to matter is how the community is interested in uh, creating to please other members of the community and not really what the technological platform is capable of. Because you see wide variance in use is a very similar platform. So I'll show you what this uh, means. So I, there are actually three components of the project. We did a survey of players, um, which I'll talk about a little bit. We did an industry survey, which I'm not going to talk about because I really haven't run the, the, the numbers on that yet. And then a survey of platforms involving coding like over 3,000 items, um, which I'll talk about. So the player survey, um, just uh, you know, um, to start with, I don't know if you can see that slide. I can barely see that slide. Um, but what did you create uh, in uh, when you created user-generated content? We asked the players, and a lot of them created uh, original uh, um, uh, objects, like uh, a Minecraft uh, uh, object, uh, or um, potentially, um, uh, you know, uh, about half of them created new skins, customized avatars, like what was the case in the City of Heroes case. Uh, a fairly large, I mean, it's, it a lot depends on how you, you know, think of this. 14% said they actually created tangible physical objects. Um, that's the, the least, you know, prevalent category. But still, 14% of people responding to a survey saying that they created craft objects based upon video games. I thought that was, you know, a pretty large number, even though it's the smallest of the different contents, uh, forms of user-generated content. Why did they do it? The, the primary reason was that they enjoyed being creative the commercial incentives were all towards the bottom. I mean, I, and uh, I just saw another, uh, actually John just forwarded me a, a survey on this. Um, uh, there's evidence that uh, this probably correlates with younger UGC creators may actually have aspirations of getting into uh, the, the game industry through user-generated content. Um, I actually didn't check that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if I found that as well in our survey. Um, so uh, what were they... Uh, drawing inspiration from if they were doing referential works. A lot of them were drawing it, well, you know, the primary category here is from, from my imagination, but uh, in terms of where they were referencing, when they referenced other video games, which you'd think would make a lot of sense, right? If you're creating content in a video game for the community that plays the video game, what is the most likely kind of reference point that would be understood by the rest of the community? You know, something like Link or Mario or something like that, right? Because we're all gamers here and we all kind of share this common, you know, category. If it's like a, a film, then you might not uh, find other people interested. Um, Minecraft was, uh, and I, you know, uh, didn't predict this, but Minecraft was huge in terms of the games where people said they actually had created user-generated content. So people feel they are being authorial in Minecraft. But World of Warcraft was second, which I really hadn't predicted as well. Second Life, which seems to get a lot of play, was very far down. That might just be because of, because of lower numbers of people actually playing Second Life. Uh, and where they downloaded content, um, Minecraft, again, at the top of the list uh, for those people we surveyed. Uh, this is the... Uh, you can't really... Um, uh, see this too well from this slide, but uh, PC players were basically a lot more interested in creating content and interested in downloading content. Whereas a platform like, uh, like mobile games or uh, people playing uh, on the Xbox, less interested, less, less likely to create content, less interested in downloading content. Um, there's some, Women who play more mobile games, I found that out. Uh, people who play MMORPGs play a lot more uh, hours per week than other gamers. This is not really related to the project. People who play on the Wii are younger. Just <laughs> Things have just jumped out from the samples. Um, uh, so I wanted to talk about the platform samples. So we, we ended up doing like about 100 samples from a variety of, of platforms. A lot of them were non-game platforms, but we did a lot of games. The Sims, Little Big Planet, Minecraft, Spore. Um, they're small samples, but a very large populations, right? So uh, 7 million Little Big Planet levels, 180 million spore creations. But even if you take a narrow slice, the magic statistics says that you can actually characterize properly that the larger uh, sphere pretty accurately through these, these very small samples. So um, there's an XKCD comic that says, basically, if you fish for data, you can find uh, anything you want to. So we're still working on that. We're trying to be ethical about it. There were some interesting copyright questions raised um, I got, I got like five minutes left, John. I'm kind of racing. Now. Uh, I'll, you know, you're, you've got six minutes left to end the okay. camera and then 10 minutes after that. Okay, great. Um, so uh, th there were some interesting copyright questions like this. Is this infringing? 
Um, it's called Disney Princesses. I recognize those as Disney Princesses. What is original about the Disney Princesses? Well, the thing that's really standing out to me is their costume design. Is in Generally, in the United States law, your, your clothing design is not covered by copyright law because it's utilitarian. Does it make a difference when it turns into a drawing? So we actually had like a half-hour-long discussion about the copyright issues raised by this Sims household uh, Disney princess mod. There are actually a bunch of those on the Sims. So here's, here's some of the numbers. Um, how often do people reference things in, in, in Minecraft? How often do they like make a Link avatar or a Will Smith avatar or... Um, uh, there's uh, Finn from Adventure Time uh, Avatar. So in Minecraft, 44%. Mod Nation Racers, uh, a random sample, uh, 33%. Second Life, 21%. The Sims, 30% Spore, 4%. And I think you can see that, that example on the far right is a Spore creature. This is probably why you know the creature creator doesn't lend itself to doing a, a, ni a nice copy of Link on it, right? It's just the creative tools don't let you do um, uh, a lot of things that be recognized as popular characters. So uh, substantial similarity uh, versus referentiality was interesting. So what you can see from this is that you know even though people in Minecraft were making references to Link, um, they weren't good enough references to be you know often to fall afoul of copyright law. They were referential, but they weren't substantially similar to the original work. Whereas in Second Life, 21% were referential and 18% were substantially similar. So Second Life creators, when they set out to you know reference a copyrighted work, usually they 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 did a really good job of it, right? Um, the Sims, you know, interestingly, uh, they were referential in that they would often name, uh, those 13% were referential in that they would name a character and say, this is an attempt to do this character, but the, I don't know if the creative tools or just like the, the, the cultural norms are such that they rarely succeeded in doing that. Okay. Um, interestingly, and I was kind of disappointed, um, the most popular uh, works tend to be more referential uh, in terms of peak popularity, the very, very top, the cream of the crop, the top 100 uh, works. So in Mod Nation, 86% of the most popular, the most downloaded uh, avatars were referential works, whereas a random sample gave us 33%. Uh, in Spore avatars, we got 54% uh, that were referential, whereas 21% from a random sample, right? So it seemed like this was generally in effect that um, fan works were generally more popular than original works uh, when you sampled and when you just focused on the, that narrow, narrow band at the very, very top works. However, if you look at the general population and say, among the works that are referential, you know, are they, do they correlate with being more popular? That is not the case, right? So if you don't look past that top cream of the crop and get down further into the stack and say, here's a fan work, here's a non-fan work, um, is one of them more popular than the other? Doesn't seem to be the case that there's any substantial, uh, you know, um, correlation, statistically significant correlation between referentiality and popularity lower down the set. And this was an interesting thing. Um, so I said that, you know, uh, that, uh, in, in terms of the Grox, right, uh, the, uh, there was a very high level of referentiality. Well, um, the 43% of the uh, avatars in Spore were referential to the Grox, who was an alien race unique to Spore. So they're referencing in-game IP. So users are creating... IP from the game and uploading that, right? So, and you think, of course, if, if they're fans of the game, of course they're going to, you know, appreciate this, and that the, um, you don't get to uh, play the Grox uh, as a player, uh, typically uh, in Spore, even though they're very important to the game. So I think that um, maybe that explains why there's this huge uh, effect. So it's interesting to consider whether that is actually a copyright problem, because presumably the, the game developers would not care if the users were creating IP that was their own IP, they'd probably be happy about it. Um, other observations about coding, I mean, one of the interesting things is sometimes communities just seem to spring up. So in Spore Vehicles, the Spore is a space-based game, uh, but you can create vehicles. There was a community of World War II creators that were just creating, you know, Messerschmitts and all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, tanks and guns and everything else, all out of World War II. Nothing about Spore would have, you know, anticipated this, but here's a community of World War II enthusiasts. They said, hey, we got these creative tools, and then they exchanged them, and you can see comments, you know, that's a really accurate thing, and then they're giving each other advice on how to do this. So nothing about the technology, and you know, would have required this, but the community just kind of latched onto this uh, platform. Well, the, the flight sim uh, community is quite a unique entity. It will latch onto almost anything. <laughs> right. Um, 
So uh, just uh, other IP issues. Uh, trademark issues were pretty prominent. Uh, we saw a, a fair number of celebrities, but not anywhere near as you know, common as the copyright problems. Uh, indecency, which people talk about a lot with user-generated content. They seem to be concerned that you know, uh, you know, something that's obscene is going to pop up and you know, people are going to experience it. It's actually very rare. I don't know if that's due to self-policing practices, but we're taking like really recent samples. So like, it would go up and we'd sample it immediately, most of these sample sets, and we weren't seeing indecency show up at all. Uh, in, in most of the sample sets. One minute to end of camera.